When we say the common law, what do we mean? We're talking about the laws of the land, the laws that we have to comply with, which are essentially created, developed and applied by judges sitting in court deciding on disputes in individual cases, deciding on disputes in the uh, civil justice system or on criminal disputes when they're dealing with criminal cases. So it's the law of the land created essentially by the judiciary. The broad common law comprises laws, legal principles articulated by judges in individual cases in court. So the common law is sometimes referred to as case law because it emanates from individual cases. The common law develops by judges following the decisions of other judges who have decided similar cases previously. And when judges follow the decision, follow the reasoning, follow the legal principles applied by judges in previous cases, what they are doing is following the doctrine of precedent, the concept of precedent. So a judge, when he decides a case today, looks back at how judges decided that simi a similar kind of case in the past, what principles did he apply, what reasoning did he apply, and the judge will follow that reasoning today. That's the operation of the doctrine of precedent. Judicial decisions that have already been made in similar cases are documented in collections of case law known as yearbooks and reports. And the photograph that I showed you at the beginning is uh, a section of the law reports. So these decisions are collected in the law reports, they create precedents, and the precedents are applied to new cases that come before the courts. We're going to look at how that's done in detail in one of the uh, later lectures. But for the moment, what we're going to do is to focus on some of the history of uh, the development of the common law. Coming back to William Blackstone, he gave us uh, a rather good definition of the common law. He says, the common law is to be found in the records of our several courts of justice, in books of reports and judicial decisions, in treatises of learned sages of the profession, prescribed and handed down to us from the times of ancient antiquity. They are the laws which give, gave rise and origin to that collection of maxims and customs which is now known by the name of common law. Now, William Blackstone was the first scholar to attempt to bring together all of the common law of uh, England, and he did this in the 18th century. He gave a series of lectures in Oxford, and the lectures were published as commentaries on the laws of England. They were produced in four volumes, so he must have been incredibly busy, between 1765 and 1769. And what he did was to attempt to systematise all of the common law decisions that had been made by judges over uh, many, many years. It was the first attempt, William Blackstone's commentaries, was the first attempt to state the entire corpus of the common law. They're still seen as probably uh, the most comprehensive summary of the body of English law ever compiled by a single author. They are said to be clear, sophisticated, and they remain highly regarded. In fact, it's said that Abraham Lincoln, uh, when he was studying to be a lawyer, used to read Blackstone by candlelight. And in fact, you might not realise it, but Blackstone is responsible for many phrases that have become part of um, common usage. And I'm sure that people don't realise where it comes from. So, for example, the, the phrase, it is better that ten guilty persons escape than one innocent person should suffer, uh, was actually first said by Sir William Blackstone. And again, we'll look at that idea that it's more important that innocent people should not be wrongly convicted. We'll look at that idea later on when we look at the values of the criminal justice system in one of the later lectures. So, the development of the common law. How did the common law develop? Now, I'm going to take you back in time because a reasonable starting point is actually in 1066 with William the Conqueror. I don't want to give the impression that there was no law 
prior to 1066 and prior to William the Conqueror uh, invading Britain uh, because there was a, a complex of local laws. But William the Conqueror was the first king to have the idea of trying to produce a unified system of law throughout um, England and Wales. So William the Conqueror uh, invaded uh, from France, he invaded England from France in 1066. As I say, there was already a functioning system of law and of local justice in the counties or what are known as shires. Um, different parts of England were actually, were actually governed by different systems of law and the systems of law often uh, derive from various people who had invaded England at one time or another. So for example there was Dane law in the north of the country, Mercian law around the middle of the country and Wessex law in the west and south west. But there was no unitary national legal system. Uh, the English legal system insofar as it existed involved a mass of oral customary rules that varied from region to region. Each county or shire had its own local court and these local courts dispensed their own justice in accordance with local customs that again varied from community to community. So you had bits of law all around the country but very different laws being enforced in different ways and it's been said that sometimes the law was enforced in a rather arbitrary fashion by local lords and landowners under the feudal system. These local courts that existed around the 11th century were not the kinds of things that we would recognise as courts today. For example, courts often consisted of informal public assemblies that weighed conflicting claims in a case, and if they couldn't reach a decision, they might ask the accused to show their guilt or innocence by carrying a red-hot iron or snatching a stone from a cauldron of boiling water or some other test of the veracity of their claim, of the truth. This was known as trial by ordeal. Now there are some debates about the extent to which these trial by ordeals actually were carried out, but it is quite clear, looking through the material at the time, that it was a recognised way of seeking to establish the truth of a person's guilt or innocence. The idea was, if you got somebody to pick up a red-hot iron, um, the defendant would pick up this red-hot iron. If the burn that would naturally um, uh, occur as a result of picking up a red-hot iron, if the wound healed uh, within uh, a few days, uh, the man would be set free. He would deem to be innocent. Uh, if he, if the, the wound didn't heal, he'd then be e executed. So it sounds like bad luck to have to pick up a, a red-hot iron, uh, the wound doesn't heal, so that'll be very sore, and then they hang you. Um, but the idea of the trial by ordeal was that if a person was innocent, that God would intervene and God would perform a miracle. So the person who had picked up the red-hot iron would have their hand heal in a matter of days because God had intervened and they would go free. Um, certainly uh, a fairly brutal way of establishing guilt or innocence. Um, it seems that actually at the time there were more acquittals than convic convictions, so perhaps it wasn't as brutal um, as it sounds, and the uh, business of trial bought by ordeal was actually eventually uh, stopped, or it was condemned by the church in the 13th century. But there is no doubt that it was a feature of local justice. So we've got this system of local courts, um, uh, with local customs and uh, trials by ordeal. William the Conqueror was interested in establishing his power and in establishing order in um, a relatively unruly kingdom. He laid the foundations of the legal system. He understood that in order to exercise real power over citizens, he needed a central system of justice over which he as king had power and he had laws that would be obeyed by the citizens. So how did he do this? He created what was called the Curia Regis, the king's court. This was a court of law, but it was also a royal household that comprised the king and some of his most trusted advisers. And the Curia Regis would be an advisory body for the king but also it would be a place where people would bring their disputes to have them decided by the king and his advisers, or essentially for the king to resolve. Now at this time, um, England, or the, the kingdom, uh, was not particularly heavily populated. 
uh, on the whole people couldn't read and write and travel around the country was difficult. Although the Romans had built lots of roads in England and Wales, they hadn't actually been fixed for the 800 years since they'd been left. So it was quite difficult to move around the country. So in order for kings to maintain their authority over uh, the entire kingdom, kings got, were in the habit of travelling around the country, taking their court and courtiers with them. So they would process to different parts of the country. And William did the same thing. He would travel around with his Curia Regis, his king's court, going around the country to different areas. And as he travelled around the country, people would come to him, citizens would come to him and bring their grievances, their complaints, their accusations against other people. And the king and his advisers would give judgment. They would give a, a ruling on the dispute. The king would literally sit on a bench and hear cases in his own court. And this is why one of the most important courts at the time was known as the Court of King's Bench. So the king would sit on his bench, have his advisers around him, and people would come uh, to bring their grievances to him. And we can see this activity, the activity of the king and his advisers going around the country and him giving rulings on disputes and grievances around the country we see this activity as the beginnings of the common law system, the beginning of a centralized or unified system of laws because you have a consistent approach by the king and his advisors. Another thing that uh, William did was to integra integrate the idea of juries into English justice. So under the jury system, uh, royal ministers or justices uh, would go out into the country to try and determine the manorial uh, estates for the purpose of taxation because they had uh, taxation in those days. Um, and what the minister would do in order to establish the value of these estates so that the king could decide how much he was going to charge people in tax, uh, the minister would call 12 free men, so people who were not serfs, uh, 12 free men together and ask them to testify under oath about the value of each estate. And this assembly of free men was called the jury. Eventually, the jury became a body responsible for finding facts in both civil and criminal cases. And I'm going to come back to the use of juries uh, in criminal cases, uh, which was developed by Henry II subsequently. So we have the idea, at this point, we've, we've reached a system where William the Conqueror, trying to establish his power over the country, he travels around the country with his Curia Regis, listening to uh, grievances and disputes and giving rulings on it. So as I said, the beginnings, the essential beginnings of the common law system. Well, after William left the throne, things went rather downhill in terms of um, social order. Uh, this, is, this gives you uh, the names of uh, some of the various kings uh, that took over after William I. Um, there was a fair bit of fighting going on uh, and disruption in the country. And in particular, during the reign of Stephen, who seemed to fight with am absolutely everybody, things went into a state of near chaos. In fact, it was said at the time that things, or it has been said, that things were so bad under King Stephen that it used to be said that it was a time when God and all his angels slept. It was such a dreadful time of chaos. Um, and the next important step in the development of the common law system was after Stephen and when Henry II came onto the throne. Henry II uh, came to the throne in 1154. He's one of what's known as the Angevin kings, uh, the kings known as Angevin uh, because of their connection with Anjou in France. So Henry II, Richard I and John uh, were known as Angevin kings. Henry II took the, fr uh, took the throne, uh, as I said, after a period of considerable disruption. He wanted to regain stability. He wanted to reform land law because there had been a lot of thieving of lands uh, during the time that Stephen was on the throne. And he wanted to deal with rampant crime. I said that he came to the throne after a period of uh, great turbulence. And Henry II played a significant role in the development of the legal system. He, like William the Conqueror, was focused on creating a single system of justice for the whole country 
that would be under the control of the king. So he was also interested in power as well as order. Uh, and it was under Henry II that for the first time judges were sent out on circuits. The idea that judges from London, from Westminster, would travel around the country. At that time, the time of Henry II, there were only 18 judges in the whole country. That's quite remarkable. When we think of the number of judges we've got nowadays that they manage with 18. Smaller population, obviously. Uh, 18 judges in the whole country. Henry ordered five of those judges to stay in London and take over the cases that he might have decided himself. And these five judges that stayed in London constituted the king's bench of judges who sat in Westminster Hall. In 1166, Henry issued a declaration of assize at Clarendon. An assize was an early form of king's council or a sitting of court. And in this declaration of 1166, Henry said that remaining judges would be sent out to travel to different parts of the country. So the idea of judges going out to different parts of the country, dispensing the justice of Westminster, dispensing the king's justice that had been decided in Westminster. So when the judges travelled, they had to apply the laws that had been made in Westminster. And in this way, gradually, local law, local justice, was replaced by new national laws. Laws that were common to all, the common law. So travelling judges formed a nucleus of judges with national jurisdiction. Uh, they didn't have local roots. And one of the advantages of having judges travelling around the country was because they didn't have any particular stake in a local area, they were less, it was thought that they were less likely to be subject to influence and even possibly corruption. So the idea that you have judges that go from Westminster, they go out to a local area, they don't know the people in the local area, and they dispense justice from London, was thought to be um, a very good way of establishing a unified legal system and one that was relatively free or protected from cor corruption. In time, the decisions of these judges started to be written down. Originally, it was all oral. Gradually, the decisions of the judges were written down. And as the decisions of these courts came to be recorded and published, so the practice developed of past precedents being applied, being cited in arguments in court, and being applied uh, by later cases, uh, in later cases. And through this system, you think about it, judges coming from Westminster, going out to uh, local areas, hearing cases, deciding cases, and beginning to write down the decisions in those cases and apply them in later cases, what you get is the gradual spread of the common law from London, from the King's Bench in Westminster, out to the rest of the country. And this is how we have a sense that the common law spreads to the whole of the country and you get the development of uh, a unified common law. The first system of law reporting, uh, well the, the first examples of law reporting uh, are from the uh, 13th century, dated from around 1272 uh, in the early years of King Edward I. And the earliest law reports are known as the yearbooks these are the principal source ma materials, the, or they were the principal source materials for the development of legal doctrines, concepts and methods. Um, and during the period when the, when, uh, the law was being reported in the yearbooks, uh, we have a period, where it is a period where the common law developed into the recognisable form that we have now. Uh, these original uh, reports were actually written in either French or Latin. So gradually we've got the spread of the common law through the country. Uh, as royal courts became uh, established, so the importance of local laws and customs uh, began, began to fade away. Uh, the content of most of the law at this time was directed largely at preventing bloodshed uh, by recognising rights to property, personal freedom and uh, punishing people who uh, committed violent acts. So that is a rather basic introduction to the development of the common law system and the common law courts. Uh, in the next section, we're going to look at some of the difficulties of the common law courts that gave rise to the development of equity. But we f before we move on to that, I want to reflect a little bit 
on uh, some of the things that I've said and the significance of um, some of the things I've been talking about. So first of all, I think it's interesting to note that the assizes system, the system of judges going out around the country and sitting in different parts of the country, established by Henry II, actually lasted pretty much until 1971. Now that itself, I think, is quite an extraordinary fact. Something established in the 13th century continues until 1971. And if you, if you think about it, we well may not think about it, but I'll tell you about it, the current, we have a current system now where High Court judges from the Queen's Bench Division still travel around the country to hear the most serious criminal offences and uh, to, hear, to deal with serious civil, um, uh, civil matters. Judges still spend, judges who sit in the High Court of Justice in London still spend part of their time each year serving in courts outside of London. That is the continuing circuit system which we see is a development from Henry II's idea in the 13th century. Uh, another of Henry II's innovations was the further development of the jury. I said it was established initially under William the Conqueror, but actually Henry II uh, used the jury for um, dealing with criminal cases. Uh, one of the things he did was to use people from uh, certain localities to bring them together, 12 people, 12 good and lawful men from townships or villages, bring them together periodically uh, for the purpose of telling the king whether or not they knew or suspected that people had committed things like robbery, murder, theft, arson and forgery. So the idea of bringing people, around, uh, bringing people together to identify members of the communi community who were thought to have committed these crimes. And that use of the jury is the precursor to the use of the grand jury, which is used uh, in America today, and it also forms the basis of uh, our two-stage system in the criminal justice system in England and Wales, where a person is brought initially on indictment and then is sent for trial. We'll look at the development of the modern jury later on, but again, it's interesting to reflect that actually the roots of the jury go back to William the Conqueror and to the uh, criminal jury go back to Henry II. So some further reflections. Until the 12th century, the vendetta, blood feuds, was actually an integral part of English life. And what we see is that the ending of blood feuds in England roughly coincided with the establishment of the king's courts in the 12th century. The courts didn't just punish criminals, they also provided a peaceful means for resolving disputes over land and other property. So the courts, even at that time, were offering a service to the public. Instead of people solving their disputes by resort to violence, what was happening is that they were being encouraged to bring their disputes and grievances to a public forum, to the court, to the, to the king, to uh, the king's justices, to be offered a remedy for a decision to be made on right and wrong and for a remedy to be offered. So what we see is the idea of encouraging people not to take the law into their own hands and resolve their disputes by resort to violence, but actually to bring them to public forums for the peaceful resolution of those disputes so that they can receive a remedy. So in the resolution of disputes over land, contracts, debts, as well as dealing with criminal offences, the courts were supporting social order and the tranquility of the state. And that is just as true today as it was in the time of William the Conqueror and Henry II. The courts underpin social order. As I said, they're not just about punishing criminal acts, they're also, also about peacefully resolving disputes. They support economic activity, they support social harmony, and um, it was a struggle to, it was a struggle at the time to get people to bring their cases to these public courts and it's something that we have to be careful to protect in modern times. Another reflection or a final reflection is the extent to which the English common law has influenced the development of legal systems around the world. This is a map which shows 
the spread of common law to other jurisdictions in the world. So the English common law tradition was transported around the world to places that had been colonised by the British. So you can see that there are common law systems in Australia, the USA, Canada and New Zealand. All of those have connections with England and other countries that have also had connections with England um, have a mixed system but also retain some elements of the common law. So for example parts of Africa, India and parts of the Far East. So we see that the influence of English common law, the values and principles of English common law has been very great, not just in our own country, but uh, in countries around the world. We're going to discuss some of the features of other legal systems later on, in particular civil law systems uh, that are common in Europe, Africa, Asia and South America.